Good morning, everyone. Lovely to welcome you on a bank holiday weekend or, or a half-term weekend when lots of families are off doing nice things this week. I'm really grateful to Anna that uh, on Wednesday afternoon, Thursday and Friday, we're getting to go away and enjoy a few last days before Anna up and leaves us, um, which could be fun. But we, we know all about the sadness of that in our hearts this morning. A uh, couple of our notices this morning, um, just to begin with our Superhero Saturday. That's next Saturday evening. We're encouraging you to dress up as a superhero. Um, I can provide you with church robes if you want to dress up as me. Um, but I'm, and I'm not that much of a hero, I know that. But lovely, lovely to have Ava organizing something for our younger families. Um, and please come along and be part of that. Next Saturday evening, there's going to be a wee spot in there where the young people are saying a wee goodbye to Anna as well. 6 o'clock to 7.30 in the church hall so that those with children can come and be part of that. Uh, a reminder that this week will be Anna's last um, midweek communion and last parish prayers. Um, it is, it's, it's a weekend of closing things out with Anna. So I really encourage you to take the time to be with us uh, next uh, next Wednesday at uh, both the Midweek Communion and at Prayers. I'd love to see the little side chapel bung uh, for those few occasions. Uh, Anna has such a heart for the praying church, such a heart for us to be a praying people. And uh, this morning, uh, let's be part of sharing in that with her and celebrate her last prayer meeting with us uh, in the church. So we come to Anna. It's all about Anna today, isn't it? Next Sunday is going to be all about Anna as well. Um, we know the answer is all about Jesus. But at the moment, it's all about Anna. Anna has served us so well. And for those who want to come along to her leaving lunch, and we're going to at each of the services next Sunday, there'll be a little moment where we do something special by way of praying for Anna and sending her off to Balmahind, uh, not just with our blessing, but with the Holy Spirit uh, taking her from here uh, to there. So please think about sharing in that special day. Uh, her farewell lunch is at 12.30 next, uh, next Sunday. Uh, Anna's preaching, so we'll definitely be finished for 12.30. Um, you're allowed to laugh at that, church. Um, and uh, I do ask that you'd help the girls in the kitchen. Now, 
Sharon and Brenda and Christine are planning um, a lunch for Anna, uh, and they're going to need some help. Um, so this morning, if you see Sharon, Brenda, or Christine, I can see uh, Sharon already there waving at me. She is willing to take your help. You can help by bringing food. You can help by offering to kit to, to help on the day or help with set up the night before. But the really essential thing that Brenda said to me yesterday was, Willie, please, please get them to book in. And we have to help, help you do that. We have a sign-up sheet this morning at the Midway Point there at the Crossroads. Please, on the welcome table, sign up or speak to Dorothy this week in the office. You can also sign up to our Facebook page uh, digitally. I tried it out on Friday and it does work. Uh, Dorothy and Ava were worrying about that apparently, so it does work. I got an email back to say I had booked twice, which was interesting. Um, so if you got me twice, sorry, I'm sorry, but at least for two anyway, so don't worry. Next slide. This is something that's a bit different this year. On Remembrance Sunday evening, normally we have a youth service. We're not having that this year, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. But what we are doing is having a service to remember loved ones who have died. And it's a time of remembering, and for all of us, um, there are different levels of grief to go on after we have a loved one die. For some, it's something so significant, like a husband, a wife, or a child, where it continues to be a pain we carry. And at that service, we're going to take the opportunity to thank God for the lives of those you have loved and you have lost. To pray for you as families as you continue in your grief, as I continue in my grief and loss as well. Um, if you want your, your family member prayed for, please make sure that Dorothy gets their name in the office. Just send her a little text or an email or whatever. Drop in with her. Uh, or say to Anna or myself through the week, and we'll make sure. It was meant to be a sign-up sheet, Anna. Did it appear? I think it did. The sign-up sheet did appear at the crossroads again. Just put your name and the name of the person you want to remember, and we'll do that. But I really encourage you to come to a special service. It will be very quiet in nature. It will be one of those spaces where we simply, before God, ask for his strength and help as we remember loved ones who are gone home to be with the Lord. But that loss is still heavy in our hearts here. Remember Sunday this year then will look like this, folks. It's always been different here. Uh, but you know what? The new broom sweeps clean and does what he thinks is the right thing. So on Remember Sunday this year, we're going to be having a normal 8.30, the normal um, 9.45 and 10 o'clock, and the normal 11.15. But all the uniformed organizations are invited to 11.15. And in the afternoon, the community service is hosted this year. The British Legion Community Service is hosted by the Methodist Church. And uh, I'm blaming Anna for this. I got an email on Friday saying, here's the job. So guess who they gave the preaching job to? Me. Um, so I'm really thankful to you for that, Anna, and grateful. But do join us for this Remembrance Sunday. And keep telling the, the scouts, the guides, those people who are in uniformed organizations that this is a special service that we'll use them in. And we're going to try and make it a service where the scouts and the guides of the parish are actually taking a lead in prayers and readings and at all that we do on Sunday morning. There will indeed be a solemn bit where we have an act of remembrance as well uh, in that 11 15 service. Ross stands before us this morning as a new man. Yes, he is a new man. Uh, Ross, uh, I want to tell you that we were really, really excited. On Friday on Facebook and on WhatsApp, there were these photographs circling of this man with his arm around this beautiful girl called Ellen. Well, uh, the really good news is that Ross and Helen have got engaged. So we give them a big round of applause. So, woo! Well done. Yeah, well done. Um, so, Ross, you're not a man with authority, but under authority. It's just how it is in life. But we really wish you well, and we're so grateful that Ross is here this morning to help us lead our worship. So, uh, there's a little message there for us about the village. The village church is starting its own little life group, but you're welcome to come along. And that time should say 2.30. It's called late at night, putting the time on our calendar, which it said should say 2.30 in the village hall on Tuesday afternoon. We'd love to have you there. Thank you. Shall we stand together as we greet one another in the name of the Lord? The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. And we bless the Lord as we sing to him and worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you. 
come and fall down in the presence of a holy God to acknowledge all the ways in which we have fallen short of God's glory. And so we pray that the Lord would have mercy on us and forgive us because of his abounding love, mercy, and grace. And so for words spoken in haste which have offended you, Lord, Lord, have mercy on us. For the thoughts of my mind which have offended you, Lord, Christ, have mercy on us. For the actions of my hands and my feet which have offended you, Lord, Lord, have mercy on us. We are assured of God's forgiveness, and so we pray these words together. Loving Lord and God, you are full of compassion and your mercies are new every morning. Fill us afresh with your holy and life-giving spirit, that we would know your power at work in us, as we flee all sin for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we come later in this service to read from Nehemiah. We'll see just how well Nehemiah chapter 8 ties in with Bible Sunday. And so we're going to pray this Bible Sunday collect together as we prepare ourselves to hear from God's Word. So together we pray, Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy Word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the blessed hope of the everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus. Amen. And as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to hear from the Bible now. Sophia comes to read to us from Nehemiah chapter 8. I think it can be found on about page 492 or thereabouts if you want to follow along in your Bible. <laughs> Nehemiah 8. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of law, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of law. Ezra, the teacher of law, stood on the high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him, on his right, stood Matthiah, Duma, 
Kamiya, Korea, Helgai, Mafia. And on his lap was Helgla, Mishla, Malchum, Hashem, Hasavana, Zechariah, and Mashalam. <laughs> There's more to come. Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiasa, Jamin, Archib, Shabbatia, Hovuk, <laughs> Messiah, Kalita, Azra, Josbad, Hanan, and Peda instructed, <laughs> instructed the people of the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go out, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drink, and send, to, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is in your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this day is holy. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, and to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because now they understood the words that had been made, made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of the family, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found, written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to, live, were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and they, and they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout the towns in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches of olive and wild olive trees from the mercy, palm and shade trees, and to make temporary shelters, as it was written. So the people went back and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their roofs. In the, in the courtyard and in the porch of the house of God in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of the entrance. The whole company had returned from exile, built temporary shelters, and lived in them. From the day of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, as were read from the book of law, they celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with regulation, there was an assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Well, um, if you're from Anna Blood, maybe you're able to read that. So, well, I'm going to get a box here. Uh, there's one made up here. Excellent. So. I loved it that this morning out in the little church, um, uh, Emma uh, told me that she had got a special Google uh, assist to help her pronounce all those words. So I'm so glad somebody else was reading those readings this morning. So Barnabas Aid. Barnabas Aid is an, a missional charity that works all over the world where there is persecuted Christians or where there are persecuted Christians. And their, their ministry is bringing help to folks who literally are in a place where they could be murdered or imprisoned or beaten for their faith. This next little video is just a reminder of why we need to get involved in our Christmas box appeal this year. Next slide, and on the video for you. Can I don't know much about Daesh, but I know that they are heartless people. They have occupied Iraq and they can harm or even kill people. It's 
the Jihad Islamic group captured parts of Syria and Iraq and imposed Sharia law. Thousands of Christians have fled the region. Many of the Jews have been killed. Twelve year old Manuela and her mother, Mariana, were among many Christian families that lived in northern Iraq. And when they saw how Christians were being mercilessly killed, they decided to flee the country. I heard how ISIS members started to kill the pastors and church people. They also raped women. When we started to receive threats because we were Christians, we were terrified. So we fled the country to come here to Jordan. Mary lost her husband in Iraq when Manuela was only nine months old. Crossing the border with her and having him by their side was a big challenge. I know that if my father was still here, he would have protected us. But I believe that even if I had the best father here on earth, my heavenly father is way beyond that. Manuela and Marianne are strong believers. They knew that God would look after them and that in him they would find refuge. So when they arrived in Jordan, it was the Christians that came forward to support them. When we arrived here, many churches welcomed us and they opened their doors for us. We are so thankful for them to stand with us and take care of us. Over the last 10 years, Jordan has seen a massive influx of refugees from Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and other war torn countries. There are currently over 6 million refugees in the land of 11 million people. The food crisis here is real, and churches are overwhelmed. Father Aid has been working in Jordan for nearly 30 years, looking after suffering Christians. When they heard about the food crisis in Jordan, they sent help. At Food Kids, we really believe that we can make a difference. There is enough food around the world, but it's not particularly distributed very well. And so we believe at Food.Give, as we operate out of the UK, as we operate out of other countries, that we can be part of, of this redistribution, as it were. Um, we can give from a place where we've been so blessed. You know, we, have, we, have, we do have access here. We do have the ability to share out of the resources that we have. This is why many churches in Jordan have been supporting Christian refugees from neighboring countries. Today, over 100 Christian families who are seen food boxes donated and packed by Christians from around the world. Manuela and her mother, Marianne, were among many families that received aid. It is Jesus Christ who moved the hearts of these Christians who have come forward to help us. We are so thankful. Many are happy that here they can sing songs and worship God without any threat or fear. Manuela can also go to school and say she wants to become a lawyer when she grows up. I want to stand up for those that are harmed and persecuted when I grow up. I want to be there for those that are going through hard times. So just like Manuela and Mariam, you can help support many suffering Christians around the world today. Like the Word of God says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we would love to invite you to join with us to help serve those in need today. Thank you. So friends, for Christmas this year, we're trying to fill a hundred of these boxes. Um, to help people like Manuela and Miriam. Imagine what it's like to be left as an orphan or to be without a husband and then have to leave a country and go somewhere to find safety. Not easy. So it's not cheap to fill a box um, if you use the, the stuff that's on the screen. And I really encourage you to use what's on the screen for your boxes this year. So it's rice, salt, sugar, lentils, chickpeas, and any other dried pulses that you can get. Um, if you want to fill just a box of salt, that's fine, because these boxes all get opened when they go to the distribution center, and they pack them as they see fit and as they need. Um, 
And we're going to get an opportunity in December, a group of us, to go to the Northern Ireland Distribution Centre and see how they do it. They send 12 tons about every two months to um, a place in the world that needs God's help. So please, this morning, the boxes are there. There's about 30 more of them there. Please take one. Um, we have 60 boxes. That's what's left. Um, the little church this morning, they took 15. So that's pretty impressive for 40, 50 people that they took 15 boxes this morning. So let us make sure we keep doing it as well. I know a lot of people are on holiday this week and aren't here, but please, please, take a box and be part of this. Thanks so much. Our Sunday School Inspire and Crash are going to head over to the hall now. The Sunday School teachers will give you a head start and you can lead the way over to the hall. And we do ask God's blessing on all the kids and all the teachers as they head over for their time of learning. And then Rini's going to come up and bring us our second reading from Hebrews chapter 7. So it's Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 to 28. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just pray before we uh, hear from the Lord in His Word this morning. God, our Father, we thank You today for Your living Word. We thank You that it is sharper than a double-edged sword that divides bone from sinew. We thank You that Your Word is a lamp and a light. And we pray that that lamp and light will shine on us this morning so that we can see what it is You want from us as Your church today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those who haven't been with us, um, we have been working our way through the book of Nehemiah. We've got to, we've got our way to uh, chapter 8, and we have probably got five more sermons to go to finish out Nehemiah. If you've missed out in the series so far, I encourage you to have a wee look online, hear what we've said each Sunday, or just to read Nehemiah. Um, from chapter 1 and catch up with us. Really what's happened is that we've got to a high point. We've got to a a, a glorious point in the life of the story of Nehemiah. And that glorious point is that Nehemiah has done the very thing that God asked him to do. Nehemiah has built the wall. It's done. It's finished. We would think that maybe the story could have ended there and Nehemiah could have gone back home or back to Susa and back to the royal court of Artaxerxes. But Nehemiah stays on. But into the story comes somebody called Ezra. You know, friends, I want to tell you that until I was about 16, I assumed Ezra was a woman. I don't know why I thought that. I always thought Ezra was a female sort of name. But, you know, if you're called Ezra this morning, I apologize. I'm not doing anything about gender. I'm just telling a story. But the beautiful thing is that Ezra appears now. 
So let's think about who these people are. Nehemiah, who is he? He is the political leader. He is the Macedonian. Okay? Okay, let's think. First minister, he's the political leader in Jerusalem. Okay? And who is Ezra? Ezra is like the bishop. He's the bishop David of the story. He's the spiritual leader. So we've got a political leader and a spiritual leader. And we're going to find out in a few verses that we've also got all these other church leaders, if you like, the priestly, priestly sort of guys, the Levites, we call them. But the pinnacle is that the walls have been built. And the people of God have watched on as God has done what God called Nehemiah to do. And we know the story. We know that it wasn't easy. There were those awful men, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and all the other friends that weren't nice people. They made it very difficult for Nehemiah to do what he was was called to do. But what did Nehemiah do? He kept praying. Nehemiah kept resolute. He didn't give up. He didn't get distracted. Remember last week? He didn't get distracted on the way. He kept saying, Now, Lord, strengthen my hand. And I want to tell you that that was a great witness to the people of God. Because the people looking on in Jerusalem, imagine them, they were watching. And you can just imagine Jimmy. You know Jimmy, the sort of guy who comes to, comes to church, but he doesn't really get involved, but he watches. You know that? Are you Jimmy? You're one of those people who watch what God's up to and wonder, will God really answer that prayer? But imagine Jimmy when, when he sees the walls going up, when he sees the gate going in place. Imagine what he's thinking. Maybe God does show favor to God's people. Maybe God does show favor to his man called out by him, Nehemiah. So the people had watched and seen God at work. That's where we're at. It's sort of a pinnacle we've reached. God has been at work, and the people have watched along and seen that. And here we see something really peculiar happen. Absolutely peculiar things happen. Look in with me at chapter 8 and verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, so basically the work was done, they'd all left Jerusalem, they'd gone back home to their little villages and towns around Jerusalem. You can sort of imagine, you know, they'd gone to Donatoni, they'd gone to Waringstein, they'd gone back to Dramara, all those sticky places out in the country, and I know we're the main thing, we're Big Bambridge here. So they'd left the big thing, and they'd gone back to the little thing, that's what they'd done. And then they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded for Israel. It's a really strange thing. Not Ezra going, I'm going to preach it to you. Not Nehemiah saying, would you listen to the God I have been, I have been talking about? It's the people saying, would you give us the words, please? Would you give us the words, please? I'm really pleased that Claire and Julian are with us this weekend, Caroline's mom and dad, my mom, mother and father-in-law. It's lovely to welcome you. Julian's not able to be in church. He hasn't been very well. We ended up, well, we're not telling the whole story there, will we? But the paramedics had to go on to the plane, which wasn't good. So we ended up in hospital most of the night and Friday night, and we send Julian our best wishes to get well. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about something Claire does every new year. One of the most amazing things, so I've been going to Christmas at the Swain for 25 years. Christmas or New Year. And I prefer New Year for one simple reason. Claire's Guinness pie. Right? It is the most... I'm telling you, the year afterwards, if you want a recipe for Guinness pie, it is the best Guinness pie in the world. I'm telling you that, not just because you see here, I say that all the time. And you see, before I came onto the Swain landscape, there was only one Guinness pie made. And now there has to be two. Because I love it so much. I would eat seconds and thirds and fourths. I am hungry for Guinness pie. I desire Guinness pie. Next slide, lad. I desire Guinness pie. Next slide, lad. And next slide. We're going to go, go, go back to that one. This one. Go back. Next one. That's it. So I desire Guinness pie. I really love it. But these people here, they were desiring God's Word. And the really interesting thing is, 
So on the first day of the seventh month, verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. Do you hear that? He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. Now just imagine that. I want you to imagine this scenario. So, I'm sort of sitting in the rectory. And Will turns up and he says, Will, Willie, would you, would you come on down to the church here because there's a group of us. Uh, it's half five in the morning. I'll be up because you know I get up early. You get the same in your WhatsApp. But he says, come on down to the church because there's a big group of us down here. In fact, all of the church community are down there and uh, they want you to get out of your bed and come down here and read the law to us. Read the scriptures to us. Now, how likely is that? Let's just think about that. But that is what happens here. And from, from 6 o'clock in the morning till 12 midday, the scriptures were read aloud. I want you to click back those two slides for me, please. Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo, probably best known for Les Miserables. Okay? He was a French uh, writer uh, and also a French politician, a big politician. Victor Hugo said this, England has two books, the Bible and Shakespeare. Interesting, isn't it? He went on to write, England made Shakespeare, but the Bible made England. Friends, this morning, if we look back in the history of England, the back to the King James Bible, 1604, when it started to, to circulate, it became a foundational thing. It was foundational to England, all of England's laws. They remain today. It shaped England's society in a way that led it to send missionaries all over the world. The Bible Society did something which I was interested in. It's a report they brought out last year, and they contacted 1,000 millennials. Look this up online. It's on, you'll actually find it through Nicky Gumbel's Read the Bible in a Year. You get to the site. You get to this information through that site. And they asked 1,000 young people born in the year 2000. Last year, they asked them this question about Bible reading. Interestingly, this wasn't just a random 1,000. This was 1,000 young people born in the millennium to go to church every Sunday. Striking. 13% read the Bible a few times a week. 13% read the Bible every week. 17% read the Bible a few times a year. 51 read, read the Bible less than once a month. And the commentator said, I don't know if it's Nicky Gumbel or Bible Society, this is tragic. When we live in a world where there are still one in five people across the world who do not have access to the Bible in their own language. Click on again for me. Go back. Sorry, guys, I got them out of six. Out of six. But this morning... I wonder, do you desire the Bible? I wonder, are you a reader of the Bible? I told you about Sterling before. A man who is 77 or 8, point blank refused to believe in Jesus. He just said he couldn't believe that anybody rose from the dead. He argued with me over and again. He was the admission tutor at Queen's. Very bright man. A physicist by background. Genius with numbers. And all the things that I'm not a genius with. I got a C in my GCSE at math. It was not bad. Michael McCart would be so disappointed in his record. Not liking numbers. But actually, that man was arguing with me about God and his existence. So what did I say to him? I said, Sterling, do you read the Bible? No, he said. I said, well, come back to me to argue about God when you've read that author. I said, 
said, you read, you read Bibles. Would you criti- read books? Would you critique somebody who you hadn't read? He said, no, I wouldn't. I said, well, read the Bible. That was 2016. He died in January 2023. And he'd read the Bible six times from cover to cover. Did you hear that? He got that little laugh from Nicky Gumbel, read the Bible in a year. And he read it every day and read the Bible six times from cover to cover. He discovered Jesus. And he died in Christ. Friends, I wonder if you desire the Bible. This morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will put a desire in you if you're a reader at all. And there's lots of us in here who spend life, our lives, reading. You know, Amazon, our, our Kindles, they're always on, aren't they? Some of you still like to buy the book. But the question I ask is, do you desire the Word of God? Because these people desired the Word of God. These people were keen for the Word of God. So keen that they said, read it to us and start at dawn and keep going until lunchtime. Read it to us. In 2004, when Alice, this after Alice was born, I ended up in hospital for three weeks. I just been told everybody I and Harold Miller came to see me. I hadn't heard the Bible for weeks. I just had not heard the Bible. I'd been out of it. He came to see me. He's the bishop. I said, Harold, read me a psalm. I was hungry, like I was for Claire's, Claire's lovely, lovely Guinness pie. I was hungry. To hear God. You know what he said to me? Well, I don't have a Bible with me. I said, Harold, then, you may go home. I want to hear from God. Friends, I encourage you to see these people with their hunger for God. Hunger to hear what God has to say. I encourage you to go home and decide that you're going to read the Bible in a year. If you're not a believer or don't know God, I say, get yourself in a place where you might know Him and might meet Him. Read it. My day starts with the Bible. I would never ever drive past the petrol station if the wee red lights on and say 19 miles left and stop and fill up. Stop and fill up the stars in the scriptures. Then something else happens here. Next slide. Something happens in the life of the church in the book of Nehemiah. And I want to say this very carefully. I, I, I read this over and over again. A man called Raymond Brown hinted at it, and then I find a really good online article about this. And what, what the writers are saying is that in Nehemiah, something changed in the life of the church. The church went from being uh, uh, the life of, of faith, of the faith as God was revealing it to the Jews, first of all, and then to the Christians. But in the life of the Jews, in Nehemiah, something changed in this passage. And I want you to see what changed. Verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing in a pulpit, first pulpit. He was standing up high, above the ground. And the people all stood up when he brought the but he started to read the Bible and he opened it. The people stood up. They respected the Bible. They loved the Bible. But then, in verse 7, the Levites, and we're going to leave all those names out, but I can't say them, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being said. Discipleship started in Nehemiah. What was happening? So we had Nehemiah, Ezra, and all these priests. What were they doing? They were teaching the people to understand what the Bible said. What is a disciple? A Greek word, it's mathetes or mathetes in the Greek. What does the word mean? Someone who is willing to be taught. That's what this word means. Someone who is willing to be taught. And that's what was happening in this 
situation in Jerusalem. These guys were saying, Nehemiah, Ezra, Levites, we don't quite know what this word is saying. Would you make it clear to us? That's the phrase that, that, is, that is used there. The Levites and the priests, these priests and Ezra and Nehemiah, they made the word of God clear to the people. They made it absolutely clear. And this is the way that God grows his church. This is how God grows his people. We grow by feeding on the word of God and understanding what it is God is actually requiring of us. Now, this sounds like Andy Pandy doing, doing scripture. This sounds very basic. Yes, we know we read the Bible and we grow up. The problem is, are we reading the Bible to grow? And are we as the teachers in the church teaching it in such a way that you can grow? Therefore, go and make disciples. You have to be disciples, people who are willing to be taught, willing learners in God's church. That's who I'm to be. It's why every day I make sure that I am taught by somebody. My life is full of podcasts and, and other people more able than me, proper big fancy bishops and priests and teachers all over the world. I say, would you teach me please? And they're, they're on the end of my phone. It's so easy to get taught the Bible today. For you and I, I also want you to notice something. In verse 5 and verse 4, when Ezra was actually opening the Bible and beginning to teach it, there was men who stood beside him. There were 13 of them. I don't know if that's significant. Might be. But I'm not going to go into that. I, I got caught down that rabbit hole in my preparation the other day. So I'm back out of that rabbit hole. But there were 13 men stood beside him. And friends, I think this is about, about people who were influential in Jerusalem saying, we're with the preacher man. And I need people to stand beside me to say I'm with this preacher. I need people to stand beside Eva to say I'm with that youth worker. I need people to stand beside our Sunday school teachers and life group leaders and say, I'm with these people who are teaching the Word of God. Stand up and be counted as those who support and encourage not just the reading of the Bible, but the teaching of the Bible. And friends, we have to become students of God's Word. It's no mistake that we have Sunday school. It's no mistake that we have life groups. No mistake at all. We need to have people to make the scriptures clear to us so we understand them and we grow. The way the Bible is written, it's written to be taught. How will people know if somebody doesn't tell them? That's how Paul said it in Romans. How will they know if they're not told? How will you grow as a Christian if you stay at home when we have life groups? How will you grow? Are you going to have a diet that is mediocre? You know, I'm going home to roast turkey today. We're having sort of a Christmas day in our house. It was great last night. I cooked the turkey last night. You know that smell in the kitchen when the turkey's cooking? I sort of wanted to do it on, you know, jingle bells. I almost wanted to play Hark the Herald. We're going home to eat well today. Why do we feed ourselves such a meager diet in the church? 1,046 households are on the church list. Friends, we're turning up 40 people at life church. Something's wrong there. Something's wrong with our hunger. Church, you hear me? We're not that hungry for Claire's Guinness pie for the Bible. 
I'm really saying, do you hear this? Diane is here this morning. She's the new coordinator of Life Group. See her. Speak to her. Be a student of God's Word. That's who we've got to be. We've even got to write long sermons, right, in that. The really good thing is I've discovered that your seats have nice cushioning. I had to sit through a two-hour speech day the other day, and I discovered your seats have nice cushioning. So I no longer feel guilty about long sermons. Thanks, nice cushion. Then I want to say to you something about God's response. When the Word of God is preached, people cry. That is a fact. When God speaks, people cry. And this is what we see here. Just look in and see what was happening in verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This is a, day, a holy day to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been mourning, have been weeping as they listened to the word of God. Friends, as we read the Bible, we must not be surprised that we cry. Because the Bible does this thing in me where it shows me who I should be and reminds me of how far off I am. How far I am away from the person that God wants me to be. And I find myself when I read the Bible going, ooh. And these guys here, as they heard the Bible, now they haven't heard it for 200 years, or 150 years, at least two generations, they had set aside listening to the law. They had a big, big dirt of it. They had a famine of the Bible. Actually, we have like 42 Bibles in our house. They had a famine of Bibles, of the Word. But when they heard it read, and had it explained to them, they began to weep. Because they knew God had a standard for them. They knew God had a purpose for them. But they weren't meeting it. I wonder, is that you this morning? Do you know God wants to be in relationship with you? Wants to relate to you? Wants to lead you in His way? Do you find yourself just, nah? Or are you weeping inside today thinking, I need to return to the Lord? But look what they say. God's response. What happens in heaven, when you and I look again at what God's saying and start to believe it and start to react to it and start to live it, what does he say? This day is holy to the Lord your God. You see the moment that you and I start responding to what God is calling from us in Scripture? God says that day's holy. And holy days like Christmas and Easter are days for food and drink in abundance. Days of celebration, folks. Celebration. That's what God, the Holy Spirit, is saying to us this morning. As you return to God and listen to the Scriptures, take it to heart, know that something happens in heaven. We know it from Luke 15. Jesus said it. There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who have no need of repentance. Don't we all know that part? We were taught in the Sunday school of mercy. Rejoicing is happening in heaven. When the people of God return to the Word of God and allow it to feed their lives and change and transform them, heaven goes into celebration mode. Rejoicing. God says this is a holy day. Just think about it. If you take His Word more seriously, God's rejoicing. The God who made you is not pointing the finger in judgment and saying, no, you're really far short and it's awful. He's saying, no, actually, you're beginning to listen to me and I'm so excited. Prodigal son story, isn't it? The prodigal father was, was looking out and he saw him come, he started to run. He didn't wait to hear an apology or a sorry or a, that's not the God we have. God's response. But what was the student's response? I keep calling it students because what is a disciple? Someone who's willing to be taught and learn. Somebody's getting it. It's good. I saw somebody repeat my words. It was great. But friends, 
What do we see in the people? Well, verse 14 on. They find written in the law, so, so they'd, they'd, they'd forgotten something that God had said. They find written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. Oh my goodness, and they're in the seventh month. And God reminds them here, he says, by the way, I have a little thing that I asked Moses to ask you to do, to celebrate. But I want to say something to you, church. We have two big festivals in the church here, Christmas and Easter. You celebrate Easter like gluttons for, I'm sorry, Christmas like gluttons for Christmas. You celebrate Easter like it never happened. I've never known a church to be full at Easter. Holy Week services, we might as well scrap them. Because nobody really comes. We always find other things to do in Holy Week. Christmas, I don't know why. We all turn out in the mouth. You know, if he hadn't died, he hadn't died and rose again. His birth would have just been incidental. I want you to think about that when it comes to Holy Week this year. And I was going to say when Anna and I try, when Willie and A and other try to, to do something unique at Holy Week, I want you to try and tap into it. Because these guys here, now that's not a law, that's just me rambling. But there's not the law here. These guys were meant to build tents. So on the seventh month of the year, these guys were meant to build tents. And what did they suddenly do? They hadn't been doing it for 150 years. From the time of Joshua through Judges, they hadn't done it. They hadn't built these booths. The Festival of Booths, Festival of Tabernacles. That's what we're talking about here. The Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what it is in Jewish culture and history. They were meant to build these little tents out of palm branches and palm olives and myrtles and all those trees that Sophia, Sophia read about this morning. But they hadn't done it. And suddenly, what were they doing? What did we discover they do? So the people went out, verse 16, look at it. The people went out and brought back branches, built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate. God, they did what God asked them to do. And friends, I've begun to see you doing what God asked you to do. Actually, I mean that. There's evidence on your tree of you being a people who are trying to do what God asked you to do. But there's so much more. There is so much more for us to do as a church. So much more of what God wants from you and in you and in me than we, are, we, have, we know at the moment. There's so much more to do with these students responded by doing what they heard God asked them to do. We've got to let the Word of God in. We've got to open the floodgates of our hearts. I wonder how many of you are going to go home today and decide, I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to take that silly 5.30 a.m. WhatsApp message that comes every morning, and I'm going to really dig into it. God's response. I want you to hear this. My God and yours rejoices when his people do his thing and listen to his word. There is the character in all of this. Rejoicing in heaven. Final slide. It's got to be a lasting journey. I know so many people who he leaves church on a Sunday morning, and I'm one of them. I've been to those big missions where God has really spoken to me, where I've been on a mountaintop with the Lord. Do you know those things? For me, it was summer madness. You know, I grew up in the summer madness era in the Church of Ireland, that big camp. God just spoke into my life over and over again in summer madness. I became fat on the things of God. And I used to go home, and ten days later, I was still on fire, but three months later, I was back to being Willie. Just sort of wandering along, Christian. It's got to be a lasting journey through the Word this morning. I love what I see. Not just that day, verse 13. On the second day of the month, the heads of the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the words of the Lord. They did it the next day. They didn't just do it for that one day. They weren't just hyped up for a day. They did it the next day. 
Then they did it again. Look at verse 18. Day after day, from the first day to the last, as were read from the book of the law. For that whole week of the festival of booths, where they built these little huts and were living in them to remind them that God had been faithful to them in, in the desert in their history. But it was a lasting journey. And friends, too often the journey isn't lasting with God. We start out well, but we don't last well. I want to give you one final curse this morning. Verse 17 says this at the tail end of it. And their joy was very great. Earlier on, we, say, we hear Nehemiah say, the joy of the Lord was their strength. Friends, if we keep going with God, joy will well up in us. And we will find ourselves different because we surrender our will and our way to the living Word of God. I don't want you to leave here and in two days give up. So what are we going to pray? Next slide. Well, that old Church of Ireland Bible Sunday College. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest God's Word. I want to encourage you to read it. My son and daughter are here this morning. You got their Bibles out. They're just covered in highlighter marks and lines and little footnotes that they've written in. Why? Because they've been reading, marking, inwardly digesting, and learning the Word of God. That's what we should be up to. Tuesday morning's podcast, the sermon. Give it an hour through the day somewhere. Read through the notes again. Ask God what He's saying. Apply it. Do what Israel did. They applied it. They, were, they discovered they needed to build the booths. They did it. I want you to pray for all who teach the Scripture. I want you to pray daily for me, for Diane, for Claire, for Anna, for Eva, for all who teach in our Sunday school, for all who teach in Inspire, for all who teach in our life group. And I also want you to pray that we'll all respond to God's word. Pray for greater numbers in the life group. Consider joining a life group. Do you hear the call to grow as God wants you to grow? I know the Bible app. Next slide. Here are things that are part of my life. ODB, our daily bread. Just Google app. Get an app every day on your phone. Google app will get, get you to that. Let you 365, another thing we use. Nine minutes a day. Get you into the Word of God. Nine minutes of the day. Bible in one year, it's a bit harder. It's good if you're retired, though. If you're retired, you have a lot of time to read the Bible. But wouldn't it be great if those of us who work downloaded that app and spent that 45, 50 minutes a day just drinking in the Word of God? Friends, we can build our lives on sand. And when we meet Jesus, our heads will be bowed low. Or we can build our lives on what He says to us. When we meet Jesus, we will know that we have done what we needed to do. I wonder where the Bible is in your life today. It suddenly got right at the center of the people of Nehemiah's day. Amen. In Nehemiah chapter 8, after Ezra read from the scriptures, the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. We get to respond to God's word now in worship as we stand together and sing, Great are you, Lord.
is offering our Amen, Amen. So let's stand and worship the Lord.
respond to God now in faith as together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as Caroline comes by to lead us in prayer. Lord, we pray for the work of the Bible Society across the world. Give your help to all who work in the translation and distribution of the Bible to tribes and peoples who do not have the Bible in their own language. We also pray for all mission agencies who send people into countries where Christianity is unknown. Help them to find mission partners for their work. Lord, we pray that you would send more workers into the harvest field as Bible teachers and preachers. Raise up from among our own number those who would serve you overseas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all who teach the Bible in this diocese and parish church. We pray for Bishop David as he organizes next year's Bishop's Bible Week. And we remember Willie. Anna, Ava, Rory, Diane, and Claire, as they teach us in our church services in Banbury. Inspire them by your Holy Spirit to make clear the message and meaning of the Scriptures, so that we can each continue to grow in faith. Lord, make our whole, whole church more hungry for your Word, and draw more people into our life group. Inspire Sunday school activities. We also remember all our Sunday school teachers, life group leaders, inspire leaders, and all who have a teaching role within our, with our children. May the teaching be powerful and life changing as your word convicts all who hear it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for peace across the world. In the Middle East, we ask for great wisdom, patience, and a seeking after what is good and true in all those who have influence and power as heads of state. Grant to the wider political world a wisdom that leads to diplomacy and a diplomacy which leads to a lasting peace. We pray your comfort for all who are bereaved through wars and conflicts, and pray for the safety of all who work as aid workers in medical relief, and as ministers of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and bereaved. Meet them with your love. Lord, comfort those who are waiting for medical tests or who have received medical results, which means further investigations and procedures. Be near to those going through medical treatment and grant them your healing. Lord, sustain with energy, skill, and patience all who work as healthcare professionals, and grant to our loved ones who are bereaved the comfort of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. 
Finally, we keep a moment for silent prayer as we bring our own prayers and thanksgiving to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers and answer them when you can. In Jesus' name we pray. As we draw our worship to a close this morning, we stand together to fix our eyes, our hearts, and our minds, and to lift our voices in worship to Jesus. He is the Word who was made flesh for us. He was the Word who shows us how to live and how to love, how to serve our great God. He is the Lamb who died on a cross so that we might live life with God. And so this morning we offer our worship and returning to Him so the Lord might return to us. So let's stand together to sing our offertory hymn, Worthy is the Lamb.
so as we go out into the world as the people of God, let us go to read, mark, and learn the Scriptures. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let us go in rejoicing, because in our returning to the Lord, this has become a sacred day before our God. We go with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in our hearts, rejoicing in the fear of the Lord. So, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.